this image and to tell me what do you see. A bouquet. A bouquet. Uh, flowers. A horse. Fl flowers. Sorry. Flowers. <laughs> Keep on going. Faces. Faces. Where? Uh, on the right, looking that way. Okay. All over the place. <laughs> so, yes, maybe someone can point to them. How many do you see? Five. Five. You see five. How many do you see? Three. Four. No, four. I don't see faces. I don't see Ah, okay, okay, okay. Now I get it. Five. Five. Now I see. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Here we go. <laughs> oh, there it is. Yeah. I was, I was this like, is why am I the only double Nazi in faces? This is three. Oh. Uh, this is four. And then yeah. I have one. And this is five. All right. Uh, <laughs> okay. Nice. So, what did just happen? We look at an image. Or we look at something and we ask, what do we see? And there is the uh, immediate answer, which is also a very superficial answer, which is the first meeting, which is, it's a bouquet, it's flowers. But then, immediately after, what happens is that we kind of look for an underlying principle, which is, in this case, it was not about the genetic makeup of the flowers, but something comes up, and the moment it comes up, and this I think it's really interesting, it becomes the principle. It is kind of within the agreement that now this is what we are doing. It becomes the game of interaction. So this I want to use to um, introduce this idea of to abstract or abstraction. So, ab abstraction, uh, it's, a, it's a word that comes from Latin. Abs, it's away, and tracto, tra traere, tra whatever, it's to draw. And if we look at the uh, Descartes, which uh, was one of uh, uh, the very big pillar in building the it started much before, but it's one of the really big pillars in, uh, in defining it. He writes, the intellectual abstraction consists in my turning my thought away from one part of the contents of some kind of rich idea to better apply it to other parts with greater attention. And before I was speaking with, which I didn't hear your name yet, yeah. Jan, and he was describing me what the physics does when he enters a biological problem. And he said, if we do a kind of model and we present it to a biologist, and then the biologist will have a thousand examples that are not in the model, mostly the answer will be, yes, of course I can put this in, but it will just complicate things and it will not increase our knowledge. So, which is something to be discussed, but what I wish to say is that when we go to the aspect of thought, we have this idea that we can look for underlying principles, and this principle can be disentangled from irrelevant details, and they can be made universal, and beyond time, beyond location. This is a very strong a tendency in the way we think of thought. And it's fun together with it. In the same fashion that we all enjoy to look for the faces and how many they are, we have a very particular kind of pleasure which is probably written somewhere between the neurons, but it's there. Now, I wish to say a few things about it, which of course, uh, it's not me saying them, but I am just gathering it from around. One is that today, more than ever, we know that no thought is isolated. So when we look at uh, uh, the 
way that Descartes was thinking about it and this amazing journey that he did with the, you know, I take out this, I take out that, and I doubt, I doubt, I doubt. And it comes to the thin statement. Um, today we, we look at it a bit diff different. And I will just uh, show it in the, with, the, with an image. This is an image of the tree of life that was designed back then by uh, Eckel. No, um, Eckels. Ken. Eckel was a contemporary of Darwin. He is the one that did these amazing images, this book with all the composition of the animals. Uh, he is probably the one main reason why evolution took over. No doubt because he had these illustrations which were rallying everybody crazy. If you didn't see his books, go look for them. Eccles, Illustrations of Evolution. So what we see in this image is something that we actually were educated to. This is a tree. It starts from down here with some kind of very simple animal. And it grows, 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 and it arrives, and of, of course, on the peak of it, it's written men, which is, why not, the apex of evolution. It's the most complex of everything. It's the, the one that is actually studying evolution. Now I'm going to put this. So that was a thought about evolution of life, or if you want, the tree of life. And this is the same thought. It's the tree of life, it's the evolution of life. It's exactly the same thought. Is it? Where is man here? First of all, it's not man anymore, it's human. Oops. We have more than one gender. But, where is it? He's, uh, what is this uh, drawing you have here? It starts from about four, four uh, uh, billion, yes. billion years ago. And then you have a scale of time that extends. Okay? And this is a kind of diversity spectrum. So you have that the first one to start are the unicellular and the bacteria. And then from here, it grows in complexity. And actually, we see that human is the very last on the exhibition, or on the evolution. And everything is actually still evolving. While in the tree, it looked that if something is going to evolve, it's going to come from us and on. Right? Because we are on the top. And here, we are actually the less evolved of them all. We are the last come. When you, like, from this picture, you know, point to the guys who are, like, the more, most evolutionary advantage and are most successful, and least successful. Now, what is interesting also, it's a really beautiful uh, um, uh, visualization. You can see also, you know, these uh, big holes they are the extinctions. Yeah. So, so you have here the lines where you see a lot of white. It's actually the lines of extinctions. So you can see that it took everything and in the big light it really made a lot of holes, very serious holes. In the bacteria it hardly touched them, which means they are actually pretty <laughs> So, and this, why I'm showing this when I'm saying no thought is isolated, it's because what I actually want to say is that though as if we can think of them as the same thought in an abstract fashion, they are spelled in an ecology. So the ecology of Eckel made perfect sense to understand evolution and to give it this kind of um, hierarchical growth which had the man on top. It was still within religion, God creation, and so on and so forth. It was immediately after the Enlightenment. But here we are looking at it 
now. This is a visualization of now, in which we are in a very different place, thought-wise, socially-wise, understanding-wise. So clearly the same thought, it's not really the same thought. It's the same thought in a very different ecology of thought. Um, what, what's this uh, uh, image? It comes from where? Uh, it is Leonard Endberg uh, visualization from 2008. Uh, um, it, it, you can find it on uh, Google and it, uh, it uh, belongs to a big project of uh, visualizing uh, biology. Okay, so uh, the other thing which I find really, really interesting is that, again, the way we are taught about abstraction has a lot to do with me, myself, and my thought. <laughs> now I sit down, I abstract, I understand, I create lucidity, I disentangle, but actually it makes a lot of sense that we begin to abstract in order to communicate. Because communication is really difficult. I would like you to concentrate for a moment on the flabbergasting diversity that sits in this room in terms of difference. We all come from different backgrounds. We, we all hold different memories, beliefs, theories, you name it. We have different experiences, we have different experiences of our being here right now and so on and so forth. But somehow we communicate, which is really not trivial, which I mean we manage to pass some sort of packets of meanings back and forth, which are good enough for us to coordinate and cooperate, because this is what we are trying to do. And it makes sense that, that abstraction is a big part of it. To package our thought in a way that they can move from within a very uh, rooted experience to somewhere that it's not necessarily rooted in the same kind of experience. And also, once we begin to do this, and this has been mentioned a few times today, we also uh, I think mostly in the opening uh, note of Martha, that we um, use abstraction to create meaning. We absolutely use abstraction to create meaning. We create simple to follow narrative, and this narrative are, uh, if you want, we download meaning from them. And we are really, really good at it. Um, and once we have this kind of meaning, if we look at it again from the evolutive standpoint, though again, I do not uh, pretend to be a specialist in the case, but it makes sense that this meaning that we create together by abstraction allows us to make prioritization, to coordinate, cooperate, and make decisions. Because one of the really, really difficult aspects of being alive in a world which is endlessly complex, whether we like it or not, and mostly we don't, it's how to bring it down to decision, action, what we do now. And, and this is my last uh, line, which is also what I, uh, if someone saw the video, it's part of what I wrote last time when we met, and that I actually think that no thought is abstract. What I mean by that uh, is a number of things. First of all, uh, I said it before also uh, about uh, memories and belief. I believe that we have certain kinds of categories. These categories we are historically inheriting. So there is one thing which is called thought, and there is one thing which is called doing or acting. And there is one thing which is called emoting or feeling, and there is one thing which is called blanking out. And they are separate. But, really? No. I am not sure at all that there is this kind of linear order 
between I think something and I do something, because there are things that I can think as much as I want and I don't do them eventually, <laughs> because I forget the computer, because I forget the, you name it, okay? And there are things that I think mostly in the making or after the making. So I believe that actually the way I tell this story, it's a bit different. I believe that we, um, we have an immensely successful strategy as a species, look at us, I mean, uh, which is actually while finding ourselves in a really, really complex world, what we do, we modify it, we redesign it, we, ad we adjust it to our needs. And this is how we know. We know by doing and changing. If you want, there is all the, there is actually, uh, the, it's very much resonant with the overall theory of the uh, autopoiesis, Valela, Maturana. It's a, uh, I, I didn't really check it one to one, but it's there. Which means that we constantly recreate the environment around us, and by doing this, this is cognition. This is how we know. We know something by taking it, by changing it, and by moving it to our needs. And please look at science. Because if someone is going to study a dolphin, he will most probably take it into a pool and then open it and then look at I mean, we take things, we change them, we move them, and then we, we realize. And so in this sense, I look at thought as, you know, part of the cycle through which we transform the universe around us, the world in which we live. And by the way, we are not alone. This is what life does. Even if you take a unicellular organism and you put it in an environment, the first thing the organism will do, it will transform the environment in a fashion which is conducive in some sort to itself. Look at the beaver. It's like, you know, we start from the unicellular mechanism and then, in my understanding, the next link between the animal kingdom and the human, it's not the apes, it's the beaver. What the beaver does? No, I, I think the beaver is... The, the beaver is gorgeous. The beaver is the thing. We should have a beaver <laughs> symbol somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's the burning problem. We need a, we need now, a, we need a beaver. We need a beaver we now. A the beaver... beaver what is so fantastic about the beaver? The beaver is actually entering some kind of forest or place with water and it starts to transform it. And it transforms it to such a depth that it creates a full ecosystem. It's called niche construction in biology, but it's a complete ecosystem. Now, the interesting part when we are thinking about transformative cycles it's not the fact that it's doing an ecosystem. It's the fact that by transforming its environment, it influences its own evolution. Because it influences the selection mechanism upon itself. So now this is very different from the concept of evolution of some meta-selection mechanism deciding all of these organisms what they are going to become. Because by transforming the world, it is influencing the selection mechanism, which means it is influencing direction of evolution, which is what we do in a very relatively conscious, maybe, fashion, but this is what we do. And I think that from the standpoint of where we are today, what <coughs> I wish to say is that I think that actually the greatness of thought, rather than being abstract, is the fact that it within this cycle that can go on without us in any fashion, it's actually what allows us to create the iterative um, uh, nature of it. And it gives us a door to tinker. But it's a door to tinker. I, I really wish to say that we don't necessarily understand, this is my understanding of course, but we don't <laughs> necessarily understand, but the greatness of it is that by entering there, we enter the iteration, 
and we modify the direction. This is the greatness of it. Exactly like the beaver, we are building our dams in, through thought, through narrative, through meaning, through concept, through lucidity, and we influence the direction. I do not believe that if you sit enough time and wait, and this is not, it's, it's not a, 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 a critic of any, of any kind, but I don't think that the change is because you will stop yourself before set doing something. You will change the ecology, and the ecology will allow you to react differently. It's at a much deeper level. Systemic. Ma? Systemic, maybe. It's all systemic. <laughs> <laughs> so, this said, uh, now we are going, so this was the really, really serious uh, introduction. Now we are going to do something, because after saying all of this, still we want to go into this territory of approximation. And if you want to approximate, you need to start. It doesn't really matter from where you start, but you need to start. You need a, a building block that begins the process and then to play around with it. To build our dam. To begin to play around with the dam and then you can understand if it needs to be more of a sphere or less of a square or more of a this or less of a that. Um, so, co correlating to the aspect of abstraction, there is this idea of the idealization, which means that if we look at science, you have the material reality. Now, it's very nice because material reality is here. Laboratory is actually where science happens. And then you have abstraction takes you to science, which is actually hypotheses and models. And idealization goes to mathematics, which means you actually code it into a language that has rules. So this is how I'm looking at it at the moment. Um, of course, whenever we speak of science, we, we have best basic assumptions to which we are not even aware. What are the basic assumptions? First of all, that nature is orderly, that there is order to be seen there. And the second one is that we can know it. And the third one is that we can know it empirically. These are huge assumptions, but they are there and they are not necessarily being taught together with science. And you have also other kind of idealization, which we all know much better, that it's like, you know, when you enter a particular model, like uh, Ian was saying before, you need to be very, you need to cut. Because if not, we cannot, uh, we cannot manage the complexity. So you need to say, okay, let's imagine there is no friction. Let's say that all the agents of an economic market are rational. Let's, let's, you know, there is plenty. And this is the greatness of it, but we a bit forget it. And uh, we need to remember that the abstractions, as well as the idealization, are always imperfect. Which means we better have many. And this is also why I find it so interesting that we are so different in this room. Because we definitely do not see things in the same fashion. And one of the power of this is that maybe we could play with different kind of models and different kind of approaches. And this is my personal take on it. There is not one thing that is going to solve it. We need to understand that they are all imperfect and we need all of them and the kind of mastery that we need is when to use what for which purpose and with whom. Mm -hmm. um, a science practiced by limited human beings in a complex world results in a widespread idealization. So this is not me, this is a, a philosopher of science that she wrote a really interesting book, it's called Idealization in Science, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name. Oh. And this, but, but, but it's, I, will, I, I thought to send the slides and to put the references in the end because my memory is a disaster. <laughs> and this is um, 
representation of hemoglobin, and this is the time, this is the moment in which I started to have a problem in physics. Because I was doing my uh, big research was to understand the structure of the uh, active site within this mega protein. It's huge, it's complex, it's, uh, it has symmetries, it has things, it has that. So the only way we had to do it, and it was 35 years ago, no, maybe not, you know, <laughs> 20. <laughs> it was many years ago. Uh, we actually had to crystallize the molecule. We had to put it in an X-ray beam, and you're studying an active site of life in an X-ray beam, and to get to the images, and then we were doing the simulation, the mathematical simulation of the X-ray refraction, and then we would get the changes in structure. And when I went to work with the simulation, and I knew that more or less this was the thing, they told me, okay, so begin to run the simulation, and I go and I read the assumption of the simulation, and it is written, imagine that your crystal is fully homogeneous. And I said, ah. And I went to the professor and I said, ah! <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Interesting conversation. Interesting conversation. <laughs> you probably could have elaborated. No, I, I know. I'm just joking. But no, but wait, the answer. Okay, now, so do me. Do me the simulation where it's not homogeneous. Take out the mathematics and do it for me. Today there are computers, back then it was an impossibility. So you were confronted with this thing, either you take this kind of assumption and then you have a research project, or go home. Because you are not to be going to be able to create the mathematics to do this. Which is an interesting point to science. We always have to remember which kind of negotiation, trade-offs we are doing in it. And we have a bit the tendency to forget it. Um, I'm, I don't know, sorry for generalizing, but it's... Um, and also, I think that this is a very nice... All scientific research has been accomplished by human agents for human ends. And yet, we claim the universal laws to be universal and to be objective. They've always been done from our standpoint for our ends. Why on earth if something like this should result in something which is objective? Maybe it does, but let's at least put a question mark. I'm coming from science. I'm doing a process to myself. So, okay, who said no? I said it already. Um, okay, so now that we've said all of this, but now we begin to play a bit because we want to do something, nevertheless. So there is something which is actually called mental models. Now they are super cool. Whoever opened the net lately, there is this thing, it's called mental models. They actually exist from the 70s, but now some mega magnate of a billionaire wrote a book in which he said that all that made his money and success was mental models, so venture capital, it's all into mental models. But they are a very nice idea. So now we are going to take them and to play a bit with them. So uh, the first thing that they say, I think it's interesting. If I have a mental model and you have a mental model and we say the same word and we are convinced that we are communicating, but actually our mental models are like the tree of Eckel and the second representation, we do not really manage. We think we communicate, we don't. So unless we become aware to this aspect of difference, yeah, you know it probably better than anybody, uh, or this, this is nice, the chicken looking at the one sitting on the balls, so she thinks he's going to give birth to something. So, broadly defined, they are any concept, framework, worldview, that helps us interpret, simulate the world, um, uh, something that we use as a narrative and is a, is a filter and is a way to simulate. 
So whether they exist or not, it's not my business now. But, for example, we all know by looking at this image that this thing is not going to work. It's. Which means we do have some kind of model that allows us to say we can try, but we're not going anywhere. So we can perform simulation which has some kind of scam. And the other thing which is interesting is that we can, we can, if you want, we can play it as a sort of capturing which stands between Umwelt, someone knows Umwelt here? No. Um, world. Yeah, but the, the, the concept was created by a biologist that was writing about the world from the standpoint of animals. And he showed how every animal has different kind of sensory perception, thus we all live in a subjective sort of world. He perceives a world that does not look in any fashion to the world that we perceive. And even subjectively, probably, we are all are in a sort of Umwelt, where the Umwelt is, what it is in German? It's Umwelt. It's all well. <laughs> yes, yeah. no, but what does it mean? <laughs> environment. <laughs> environment. It's environment. It's environment. Okay. So it's no, no, it's not it's the same. same. It's, it's, it's Umwelt is not the same concept as environment is. So in German, almost any, any system theoretician is working with the concept of Umwelt and not uh, environment, except it's general system theory. But when it comes to systems, as autobiotic systems. It's all bad. Yeah. System and the bad. difference being that this is as it is perceived by the by the or it is subjective. It's it is a primary uh, difference. It's the primary difference system on bad. Yeah. Um, yeah, but you know it. It's used as environment also in systems. Mm -hmm. I would translate you know it with out the world, for example. It's, uh, it's human system and environment. That's an environment, environment as about experienced about by the system. Yeah, of course, in German, but, but she has read it in, in English. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so actually what it gives us, it's a way to, be, to place this idea of mental models. So it's in between this fully, subjectively uh, perceived world, which, you know, it's unique. No, we have absolutely no, no assumption of... Uh, understanding, describing, uh, modeling. And the, on the other side, the fact that we really love to do models. We are very good at it. We are very good to schematize ideas. And so it's in between these two. It plays with these two. OK. And this is the other and the last. Yeah. Uh, which this is actually, it's a, a mental model, but from a completely different discipline. It's actually from UX design, from uh, interaction design, human machine. And they want to explain to designers what does it mean that if you come from the part of the implementation, which can be engineering or, or algorithmic or code, you have something that usually is not a very palatable, it's not a very attractive. And when you cross this, then you come to something that looks like the iPhone. But, <laughs> no, this is the... This is the it used them to be the Marlboro package. This is the perfect thing it's to make It's always it. America. No, no. I'm a ah. boy, <laughs> Let's make America great again. <laughs> uh, so, but I think that we can go also back to what, what I spoke about, uh, abstraction which means we always try to go from something that is actually really, really not simple to something that makes so much, you know, you can say, ah, of course, and put it in your pocket. And there is this tendency. Um, okay, so we have few versions of mental models. I'm really running on it so that you will know what to look for. Uh, they can be metaphors. To take oneself with a grain of salt, the boiling frog, if you have a hammer, everything is a nail. These are the simplest of them. They can be conceptual models, so it can be like the black box from physics, or cycles in nature, or critical mass, or they are all mental models. You can go to mathematical models, for example, uh, but we still perceive it in a fashion which is very figurative, yes? unless uh, someone is a mathematician, like the butterfly uh, effect from chaos. Um, or it can be a principle, so 
So I don't know, Qualcomm Razor um, or or other things, or it can be even a full uh, world view. Uh, um, this is this is a very nice one, but not now. <laughs> so. <laughs> The other thing that comes with mental models, if we are already in this uh, schematization of mind, so let's continue with it, um, there is, of course, cognitive biases, which can also be, they can be pointed at. So, cognitive biases are defined as systematic error in thinking that affects the decision and judgment that pe people make. And here, of course, you can see we are still in the uh, structure of, you know, we first think, then we do, so let's change the thing, and then... But this is the process right now. And to give you an idea, <coughs> each one of them is a cognitive bias. So, if someone thought we are perfect, we are not. And for the joy of knowing our own limitation, I brought it in a format that you can actually read it. Yay. <laughs> I thought that if we are dealing with the thought and the school and whatever, we can have it. And since also that one is not really easy to read, we have here, of course, this is uh, stuff which is out there, yes? It's uh, Wikipedia, it's... Uh, these are two lists that actually give also the meaning of each one of them. Have fun. Um, which... So, very, very simply to give an idea of what we mean by a cognitive bias. So, a confirmation bias. The fact that if we look at information and we are watching a lot of information, the information that confirms our belief is the one that will get the most value. And we will not be aware to it at all. Uh, attribution bias. We are very good at criticizing the biases of others and much less good at criticizing the same bias in us or whatever. So why are you always so anxious to criticize me? I just think I have a knack for seeing other people's faults. Right? <laughs> what about your own faults? I have a knack for overlooking them, which is great. And I am, again, there is something that goes with this idea of cognitive biases is as if we found the bugs in the system. And now we are going to fix the bugs. I don't agree with it at all. I think cognitive biases are a nice way now to have a look, but we are not going to correct any of it. But it's a nice way to play with it. There are no bugs in the code, we are not going to fix them, the whole code is fucked from the beginning, <laughs> with or without the bugs. So, <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. And this, also it's nice, it's called the just world bias, in which if you have an advantage, you, are, you have a tendency to think that it's a just world in which you got this advantage because you deserve it. So, you know, it's, uh, there is no justice in the world, there is some justice in the world, the world is just, <laughs> of course. Zero. Tov. Achshav. Okay, so this I just like the, the quote. Uh, science is not enough, religion is not enough, art is not enough, politics and economics are not enough, nor is love, nor is beauty, nor is action. However disinterested, However sublime is contemplation. Nothing short of everything will really do. And I think we have quite a lot of everything in this room. So... Oh, you got sweet go and home. romantic on us at the end. You saw? You got, that was, I did that was a 180. It. You went from yeah, cold yeah. and hard to... <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's Axley. It's okay. I love Axley. Axley is okay. Axley. Yeah.